Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a, a lovely introduction, and, uh, and thank you for the welcome. And thank you for the invitation to deliver a very prestigious address, the, the Pietisa Disanayaka Endowment Lecture. I'm so happy to be back in Sri Lanka. Uh, we arrived a couple of days ago jet-lagged. We'd been travelling in Europe. And even over the next 24 or 48 hours as I've been here, it feels like coming home. And I think that's because everyone is so warm, so welcoming. Uh, I, my family origin is from the south of India, and so a lot of the topography is very similar to Sri Lanka. And I feel that I'm amongst friends, and I think that that's a very important thing when it comes to collegiality. The Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists is honoured to join with the Sri Lankan College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists for this Congress. And it's lovely to see our logo up on the screen. We have had a strong relationship that goes back over many decades, and I know that many Sri Lankan obstetricians and gynaecologists have come to Australia for training, and many have moved there. And I'm going to come back to that concept of whether that is necessarily a good thing for Sri Lanka, uh, but I know that there is an attraction in coming to Australia. And I hope also that as we develop our memorandum of understanding with the college and our bilateral relationship with Sri Lanka, that we work towards looking at what we can learn from Sri Lanka and the potential of people coming to work here. Dr. Disanayaka was born on the 11th of December, 1924, and he received his education entirely at Royal College Colombo. He graduated in 1950 with honours from the Colombo Medical Faculty of the University of Ceylon. He was fondly called Piedissa, or Piedissa, by his batchmates and friends. Piedissa had a long and illustrious career. He was a medical practitioner, he was a medical administrator, and he was a teacher. He worked in the United Kingdom and in Germany, but this is important and this is what I want to link it to, is that he spent most of his working life improving healthcare in his home country in Sri Lanka. He was a consummate clinician and that was recognised, but his greatest passion lay in teaching, nurturing a new generation of Sri Lankan doctors. He was ahead of his time in recognising the importance of teamwork a concept that we now refer to fairly easily, the concept of a multidisciplinary team, but he recognised that the doctor should not have sole responsibility for the input in the care of a patient. A patient is also not an island, and Dr Dissa recognised his patient as a person with physical, psychological, social and spiritual needs. He was a great leader and a visionary, someone to inspire us today and by all accounts, a warm and generous man. And so I use that inspiration of my understanding of him to give this lecture today. But maybe my job was made a little bit easier by meeting his daughters, Minori and Chandrika, who, having not had an opportunity to meet Dr Dissa, I have had an opportunity to meet him through you. And your warmth and your kindness, your... Um, obvious intellect and extraordinary achievements in medicine uh, are inspiring to me. And I'm honoured to meet you and honoured to speak uh, in, in the endowment lecture to your father. He would have been very proud of you and all that you have achieved. So the topic is a broad one. The clinical aspects of miscarriage are well known to this audience. The variability you know, can be defined depending on what gestation you want to look at it. We tend to think of miscarriage as something that happens early in pregnancy, but it can happen up to 20 weeks. It's basically looking at the loss of pregnancy before the age of viability. The incidence can be as high as 10 to 15% of all pregnancies, although if we bring in earlier gestations, then we could have a much higher figure. And the interesting thing is that it's a common event. It usually occurs without significant physical morbidity. Miscarriage, therefore, in most communities, is treated as something that is medical, a benign event. Sure, 
we know that you can have potential complications. You can have heavy bleeding. You could have vasovagal collapse, infection, or retain products of conception. And obviously, we need to be aware of the medical and surgical management. And in recurrent miscarriage, and I think there's a lecture on this tomorrow, we need to investigate for thrombophilias or autoimmune conditions, translocations or uterine anomalies. And we heard in the lecture last night about the risk of cervical incompetence and how that could be managed. We now know that administration of progesterone in patients who have had recurrent miscarriage has been demonstrated to reduce the risk. And certainly in Australia, this is now a licensed indication for progesterone. But my challenge to you, my challenge to myself, to our profession, is that enough? What does it mean to the woman who experiences miscarriage? Is it simply a small hurdle on the way to becoming mo a mother? Just a little setback? How often have we heard those expressions? It was all for the best. It's lucky that it happened early. There was probably something wrong. It doesn't matter, you got pregnant so you'll be able to get pregnant again. You just go and try again and just put that one behind you. Now, for some women, that may be comforting, but I would actually argue that for, in my ex professional experience, that women accept these words from health professionals, family and friends, and then they go away with other feelings. And that's something I really want to challenge us with, is the assumption that once we've said something, and that woman says, thank you, doctor, and walks out of the room. Of course she's going to do that. She's going to be polite. She's going to be deferential. But I want us to think about what she does when she leaves the room, what she does and how she feels when she's on her own, and when she reflects on those words and how they were said. Because miscarriage is a loss. It's a profound loss for the person who experiences it. The realisation of pregnancy is the beginning of the journey of motherhood. A mother is connected to her child from the moment of conception. She is her baby's life support, the only mechanism by which her baby can survive. She is her baby's food, her baby's oxygen, her baby's home. Think about that level of responsibility. I'll give you a little analogy. In Vanuatu, and this was many years ago and it may have changed, but there was no ventilator in the country and the child develops Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now with Guillain-Barre syndrome, you, you, you basically can't breathe and you need to be on a ventilator, but there's no ventilator. So the doctor said to the parents, you will need to take your child home and your child will not survive. So the parents took that child home and for every minute of every hour of every day, they bag and mask that child. And as their hand got tired, they kept on bag and masking. As they got hungry, they kept on bag and masking. Every need that they had, they put aside so that they could keep on doing that. And that child survived. And that is the experience of a mother, is that everything she does, every heartbeat, everything she eats and drinks is about being a life support system for that child. And when miscarriage or pregnancy loss occurs, then in some way she has a sense of being a failure. In some way she has allowed that child to die. And our language and the way that we communicate with her can influence her experience of that loss. It can vary between cultures. And again, it's not for me to stand up here and to say this is the way that people experience things. For instance, the World Health Organization did a report about women in Nigeria. And they said that they were more likely to be found guilty by those around her for the loss of her child than she would be to get support. The cultural superstitions would hold that her loss was a punishment by God for bad behaviours that would weigh much heavier than any of her physical or emotional needs. On the other hand, there's a more sensitive approach. No, I mean, that's my words. There's a different approach in Japan. There is a ritual called Mizoko Kuyo, a Buddhist ceremony for those who have had a miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion. In many societies, this pregnancy loss is something to be kept behind closed doors. But Mizoko Kuyo brings this grief to the forefront in an attempt to comfort the soul of the diseased baby 
while easing the grief of the parents. And so they create a shrine and remember that life that was lost. So maybe in talking about miscarriage, the message that I want to give is that we shouldn't be dismissive of it as something that is minor, trivial. It is profound for those women that, that feel that, that experience. And maybe I'd like to summarise it with a poem by an American author called Susan Erling. And it's called For Just Those Few Weeks. For just those few weeks I had you to myself, and that seemed too short a time to be changed so profoundly. In those few weeks I came to know you and to love you. You came to trust me with your life. Oh, what a life I had planned for you. Just those few weeks when I lost you, I lost a lifetime of hopes, plans, dreams and aspirations. A slice of my future simply vanished overnight. Just those few weeks, it wasn't enough time to convince others how special and important you were. How odd. A truly unique person has recently died and no one is mourning the passing. Just a mere few weeks, and no normal person would cry all night over a tiny, unfinished baby or get depressed and withdraw day after endless day. No one would, so why am I? You were just those few weeks, my little one. You darted in and out of my life so quickly. But it seems that all the time you needed to make my life richer was there and to give me a gl glimpse of eternity. So what needs to be appreciated about miscarriage is that for many women it comes that it is loss and with loss comes grief. And the difficulty for doctors is that the condition is common and the physical man manifestations are minimal. The medical model that we operate with focuses on f physical manifestations rather than psychological impact. We see this in other areas of medicine. Think of a patient who has a diagnosis of cancer. What's the first thing that we do? We immediately go to investigations, diagnosis, the management, maybe talking about the prognosis. All of that's highly relevant. Of course, that's what we need to do. But is that really what the person's thinking about? It's interesting as you get older and you start to contemplate your own mortality, I realise that the things that matter to me might not be that treatment. It might not just be survival. It might be what my relationships are with different people, the things that I want to do while I'm still on the planet, how I want to live, my dignity. So the medical model really doesn't allow for all of that. The single greatest limiting factor, I think, is not that we don't understand. It's not that we're not compassionate. It's not that we don't care. It's not that we don't know. I think that the single greatest um, impediment is time. To explore those issues, to sit down and to try to tease those things out with each patient is, requires an enormous amount of time. And it also requires a particular skill which we're not necessarily trained in uh, through our medical curriculum. And so we need to decide what is it that doctors are going to deliver. And I bring you back to the opening lecture this morning because I think that that lecture and the discussion of the app and the discussion of AI and the potential for technology to really play a massive role in medical care is actually where we have an opportunity. Because when AI can do the diagnostic tests, when AI will know so much more than any individual human can know, when AI can process that, advise on what the appropriate next steps are, and in fact, when AI can be trained like a driverless car or a, dri or a pilotless plane to do the operation, all of these things seem so futuristic, but we know that we're just about there, then maybe what that will do is free up the humans the doctors who have an understanding of how all of this works, to communicate effectively with the women um, who are experiencing these profound changes. So the title of this talk is also Miscarriage and Traumatic Birth Experience. And to begin with, I wasn't sure how those two things would link, given that one occurs at the beginning of pregnancy and one occurs at the end. But I think that how they are linked is that what they speak to is the experience that a woman has, which is very different from our objective view of what she's experiencing. For obstetricians and midwives, if a woman has a normal labour, 
and we use the term normal, a labour and vaginal birth, and she's okay and the baby's okay and there isn't a postpartum hemorrhage and she hasn't had too much perineal trauma, then for us, good, everything was fine. But that isn't necessarily the way that that woman experienced it. And of course, the thing that we need to understand is that experience is subjective. Ultimately, it can never be objective. And so we need to be aware that for that woman, an experience that we might consider to be okay can be essentially traumatic. Perhaps the greatest contributor to trauma in this setting is a sense of loss of control. And that fear can begin prior to pregnancy, during pregnancy, with the first contraction. Pregnancy, labour and birth themselves are profound life experiences. There's no benchmark. In the emergency, we say to the patient, this is what we have to do to save you and your baby. And we expect her to deal with it. I remember a patient, and it still worries me when I reflect back on what I did on that day. A woman who had had a normal birth, everything was fine, but then she started to bleed and the placenta was still inside. And I thought it through and I thought, we can go to theatres, but that's going to take another half an hour to get into an operating theatre, or I can do a manual removal. And I did a manual removal with inadequate analgesia. And that woman, I think, probably to this day is still traumatised. It was awful at the time, it was awful afterwards. And luckily I maintained a relationship with her and was able to apologise and acknowledge what she had experienced. But at the time, in my head, I was simply stopping the bleeding. It wasn't how she experienced it. And we now know that consumers are voicing their concerns. In, my, uh, in, in Australia, we have the states, and my state is New South Wales. The parliament has instructed that a select committee be established to inquire into and report on birth trauma, and in particular, the experience and prevalence of birth trauma, including, but not limited to, as a result of inappropriate disrespectful or abusive treatment before, during and after birth, and this is important, also referred to as obstetric violence. Those are strong words, but this is what the consumers are going to hold us to. This is what a parliament in Australia is now recognising. The parliament wants the causes and factors contributing birth trauma to be looked at, including current evaluation evaluation of current practices in obstetric care, use of instruments and devices for assisted birth, for example, forceps and vontus, the availability of often systemic barriers to trauma-informed care being provided during pregnancy, during birth and following birth, the physical, emotional, psychological and economic impacts of birth trauma, including both short and long-term impacts on patients and their families and health workers. Exacerbating factors in delivering and accessing maternity care that impact on birth trauma generally, but also looking at people in rural and remote Australia, First Nations people, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In our country, we use the term culturally and linguistically diverse people, recognise that Australia is very multicultural, and those who come from the LBGTQIA plus community, and also young parents who are affected in their own way. This is important, and I'll talk to this a little later, the role and importance of informed choice in maternity care. And trying to even work out what that means, I'll tell you what Ranscog's journey has been. What sort of information do we give patients during their care to help them to prepare for, for birth and to help reduce the incidence of birth trauma? And whether, in fact, the current legal and regulatory settings are sufficient to protect women experiencing birth trauma. And this, I think, is a concern for the medical profession. We need to recognise that we're going to be held accountable in a very different way and that the medical legal implications for our practice are significant. When, when Ranscog, the, our college, decided to explore the concept of informed birth, we went through that discussion about how do you inform someone? What process do you use? Do you sit down at every antenatal visit and explain every single thing that might happen? Do you have a whole lot of written material which says a consent that this might happen in your labour, this might happen in your delivery? 
what happens when you get to the point of a labour or a delivery and you need to say to someone, your baby's distressed and I need to perform an instrumental delivery, should you get written consent? Should you get verbal consent? What does consent mean in that acute situation? We eventually not quite gave up, but recognised that this was almost an impossible task. And I think that the um, Montgomery case in the United Kingdom gives us some insight, and I want to concentrate on that for a little bit. So in March 2015, the UK Supreme Court ruled on this landmark case, which is basically about patients' autonomy and again goes to the way that we look after people and the impact of birth trauma. So Nadine Montgomery was a very short woman. She had diabetes and she was in her first pregnancy. And she kept on saying to her doctors that she was worried that she might have problems with the delivery of her large baby. It was recognised that she had a large baby. Now, she did not at any point in time specifically say, I want a caesarean section. She ended up having a labour, a vaginal birth. It was complicated by shoulder dystocia and her baby, her son, developed cerebral palsy. There was no documentation to say that Mrs Montgomery had been advised of the potential risks of vaginal delivery or shoulder dystocia. Nor was there any discussion about an elective caesarean section. The obstetrician defended her practice. She said that the risk of shoulder dystocia was definitely significant. However, the absolute risk of grave injury resulting from it was minimal and therefore she was not obliged to discuss it. She said that such discussions were not standard practice and she said if all diabetic women are told that there is a risk of these consequences, they would all choose caesarean section and this would not be in their best interests. Also, she said, Mrs Montgomery never asked about caesarean section, so she wasn't under any obligation to discuss it. Mrs Montgomery said, but if you had talked to me about it, I would have considered it. And then I would have avoided a um, vaginal birth and the complications, and you didn't talk to me about it. And the court eventually found in Mrs Montgomery's favour and awarded her £9 million in damages. Now, in the past, the legal test was very different. The idea was that you needed to prove that your practice was in line with how a body of responsible practitioners would act, the so-called Bolan principles. You were only obliged to inform patients of risk if these were perceived by the doctor to be significant. And it's really interesting because the Montgomery case now shifts that completely. It now enshrines in case law, and I think that will influence law in Sri Lanka and it has already influenced law in Australia, that it is no longer up to the doctor to decide the extent of disclosure about risk. Rather, it is up to the patient to decide. Doctors have a legal and ethical duty to obtain a competent patient's consent before embarking on any kind of treatment, except under exceptional circumstances. And competent patients have an absolute right to accept or refuse treatment. The Montgomery ruling doesn't change that. So if a patient is going to consent to something, they need to have capacity to do so, they need to be provided with sufficient information, and they need to be free from coercion and give their decision voluntarily. It's definitely good practice to document your consent in writing, especially for interventions like surgery, although much, much more complicated in a labour particularly when the decisions are made urgently. And so there's some dispute over whether written is actually a legal requirement, but I think my advice to you would be to document as much as you possibly can. But the important thing is, and this does relate to this new future understanding of birth trauma, is that the judgment in Montgomery clarifies that it is the patient, not the doctor, who determines how much information is required and whether the consent is sufficient. So. It could be that we need to understand that we cannot decide for the patient. We need to have an understanding about what's important to her. We need to appreciate that she has her own specific needs and we now have an obligation to communicate it. Mrs Montgomery won her case because she had been advised of the she had not been advised of the risks of vaginal birth 
or offered the option of caesarean section. She had not specifically inquired about caesarean section, however, the judge ruled that her obstetrician still had a duty of care to discuss that option with her. In her ruling, the judge intimated that the medical team may have thought that vaginal delivery is superior to caesarean section, and obstetricians are all very familiar with that theme. Vaginal delivery at all costs. And those of us who have been around for long enough have known that the way, the way we've achieved vaginal delivery at all costs was not good. And there is this continual discussion about the rise in caesarean section rate and what we should do to reduce that caesarean section rate, as though caesarean section as an outcome is totally bad and that vaginal delivery is always preferable. Well, we now know that isn't always the case. And interestingly, in that judgment, the judge referred to the concept that vaginal delivery was morally superior to caesarean section. She said, gone are the days when it was thought that on becoming pregnant, a woman lost not only her capacity, but also a right to act as a genuinely autonomous being. And this is the challenge to us. This is the challenge to us to be respectful of women, to be respectful of their autonomy, to not decide that the day that they become married or the day that they really are born, that that is the way to approach women. And we need to take that into our care during pregnancy and not, not think that, a, that becoming pregnant diminishes a woman's responsibility or, the, or, the, or her desires or her wishes to be autonomous. The reality is, and this is going to shock all of you who are in the audience, doctors are no longer gods. We were brought up to believe that. We were brought up to believe that we know more than everybody else that we hold some sort of superior position in society. And in fact, in the past, that had some truth. The doctors and the priests held all of the knowledge. They were actually the most powerful group in the community because knowledge could only be held by a few, but it wasn't freely available. But the world has changed. It's not just about power over life and death, health over ill health. It is about knowledge. The reality is, is that you can now Google it. And that's not being facetious, that's the truth. And it may be that often our patient knows more than we do. I don't know whether you've had that experience, but I've had it, where a patient comes in and says, I have this particular condition. And I think, I actually don't know about that condition. I have to go away and read about it and understand it because that's maybe an uncommon condition. We now, and I'm sure you do that in Sri Lanka, are able to screen for so many conditions, particularly um, recessive gene conditions. There are recessive gene conditions that I have never heard of. I didn't study in medical school, and I don't know what their manifestations are. The computer does know that, and the patient has access to that information. AI can now take a history. AI can now read an X-ray and histopathology and, in fact, perform better than a human can. AI has computational abilities and a repository of knowledge beyond any single human. It isn't absurd to say that AI could match out a, a, um, sorry, map out a human body, be taught to see this is the appendix, this is a vessel, this is an, um, a nerve, and then have a robot that's able to go in and dissect out that, that organ. These are not crazy things. I mean, and admittedly, sure, it will change in that, it, it won't change completely in that you'll still need someone to deliver the baby and to do those sort of technical things. But then I would argue, does it need to be us? Because I'm sure you know plenty of obstetricians who should not be led anywhere near an instrument. And the other thing is that sometimes there are people who don't necessarily have our training who could be taught the technical aspects and might be technically very good. So this is why we need to think about what it is that our future is and think about that in the context of what we do. The thing that we need to decide is what is our superpower? What is it that we're going to add in a world where technology is replacing so many of the things that we do.
Are we going to become obsolete? No. And is that going to happen tomorrow? No. But we need to prepare for the future. And again, going to the lecture that was said today, that was given this morning, was that understanding of people who look to the future look way ahead. They don't just do things in a stepwise thing. They don't wait for the future to come to them. So given that all of this knowledge is now going to become readily available, what will be the role of doctors? I think, and I think that it, in, it, in some ways it's sort of unpopular or it sounds like a soft skill or it sounds like something that's too minor, but I genuinely believe that the role of the doctor of the future is empathy and human connection. It is kindness and compassion. It is consideration and respect. And I think that in many ways our profession has failed in that area. I think that we have been too powerful and we've developed a hubris that means that we are not considerate of the patient's needs. Doctors, we are a service industry. That's our role. We are here to serve our patients. We're here to serve the citizens of our country. We have a particular skill that we have developed and we should use that skill to care for the people who, who need it. We need to recognise that there can be sort of three things. You can do it badly, you can do it in a neutral way and you can do it well. But we can profoundly harm people when we do it badly. When we lack compassion, when we lack kindness, when we lack understanding, when we, don't, when we are unkind, we can easily understand the impact that that can have. But even when we're neutral, even when there was an opportunity to show care or compassion or understanding, a gentle touch, a kind word, when we didn't utilise that opportunity, we also did harm. Because the patient came to us as a doctor. They came to us seeking that from us. And we do have that extraordinary power if imparting compassion and kindness. When a doctor talks to you and is kind to you, it's a different impact than when any other human being does it. And we need to make a choice as to whether we tip into the positive and actually proactively use that in the setting of miscarriage and birth trauma and, in fact, in everything that we do. We can't just be there to off offer diagnosis and treatment because the computer will do that better than us. So the Montgomery case highlights that experience is subjective. It is in the eye of the beholder. Whether it's miscarriage or birth trauma, what matters is the woman's perception, the woman's experience, the woman's wishes and expectations. We need to think about whether we're listening. We need to think about whether we're actually hearing what that woman is saying to us and whether we're responding appropriately. Now, possibly I've left you with a message that says, well, I can't do that. You're just asking too much. How am I possibly going to be able to understand what that individual woman wants or needs? Maybe, and I recognise this, and I said this to the fellows last night, our profession is such a difficult one. It's time-consuming, it's exhausting, it's emotional... It's physically draining. And so we can get to the point when we're talking about all of these women trying to care about this huge population with limited resources, limited time, and feel overwhelmed. So I wanted to leave you with a little story. And this story is to think about that woman who had a miscarriage or that woman who has had a birth, an experience of birth trauma and the difficulty of having to look after so many of them. If you go down to the beach at Fort or at Gaul, last night there was a massive storm. And during that storm, thousands and thousands of starfish were washed up on the shore. And an old man is walking along the beach and he comes across a little boy. And the little boy is picking up a starfish taking it back and placing it in the water, showing it kindness, showing compassion, trying to look after it. And the old man says, this is silly. There are too many of them. You can't possibly look after all of these people, all of these starfish. You can't possibly understand their needs, their wishes. You can't rescue them all. It will make no difference. 
and the little boy picks up a starfish and he takes it and he places it in the water and he says to the old man, well, I think it made a difference to that one. And I think that that's all that we can do as doctors is to think about that individual who is in front of us and make a difference to that one. Thank you.